If you were one of the 33 to 68 percent of the 89 million people that tested positive for COVID-19 and had the symptom of anosmia, loss of taste and smell, you know how dehabilitating the condition is. Some people are born with anosmia, others develop it after trauma or illness. Without the ability to sense stimuli, your body has trouble recognizing, organizing, and carrying out correct biological responses. Unexpectedly, conditions like anosmia leave body susceptible, which can result in life-threatening situations. You hear an iPhone when your sibling needs a ride, a Microsoft when your friend wants to study, and a red Canvas logo for when your professor publishes grades. Just like how we have different apps for messaging certain people, each type of sensory cell has its own communication system to send messages along specific labeled lines of neurons to the brain. They do so by creating action potentials, which can translate chemical, mechanical, or electromagnetic stimuli into electric impulses. This process is transduction. Let's take a look at transduction and how chemo's receptors of olfaction work. So the friend to your left farted during lecture and you're trying not to make any obvious indication of the pungent rotten egg aroma filling the room, but your olfactory receptor says otherwise. First, the odorants in the fart travel up your nostrils and pass the many hairs and wall of mucus that are the first line of defense for foreign invaders. If you notice, your nose hair's purpose is to filter these particles and make sure that no particles get trapped in the lungs. The mucus that your hair sticks to are vital for keeping the air you breathe moist and warm. It also traps odorants and allows them to diffuse into the olfactory receptors of the olfactory epithelium. Now let's zoom in on the upper portion of the olfactory region. If the olfactory receptor is stimulated by an olfactant, which will depolarize the cell enough to reach the all or nothing threshold value, then an action potential is generated. From there, the electric impulse will travel to the axon terminals to the olfactory receptor where the neurotransmitters will be released into the synaptic cleft between the olfactory receptor and the mitral cell. Once the electrical signal baton is passed to the mitral cell from the receptor cell, action potentials race along the olfactory nerve, aka tract, to the olfactory and orbital frontal cortices for interpretation. Interestingly, the olfactory nerve doesn't pass through the thalamus as seen in our other senses. So in summary, the message gets sent from the receptor to the olfactory bulb, to the olfactory nerve, to the tract, and to the brain. Now let's zoom in even more to see the cell physiology. Odorants then bind to a G-protein coupled receptor on the olfactory receptor's dendritic region. These dendrites are also referred to as olfactory cilia, though they're not really cilia at all. Odorants binding trigger a series of events involving secondary messenger proteins, such as CAMP, and allow calcium ion channels to open, which allow an influx of calcium into the cell. As more and more odorants bind to the receptor on the cilia, summation causes the receptor potentials to grow larger. Altogether, odorants can stimulate a certain combination of the approximately 6 million olfactory receptors, along with their supporting and basal cell friends, in the dime-sized area that is the olfactory epithelium. For example, if your neighbor's fart stimulated receptor cells A, B, and C, the smell of car oil might arise. If receptor cells C, D, and F are stimulated, then the smell of rotten carcass might arise. Every combination of olfactory receptors stimulated will code for a unique smell, and that's why we as humans can discriminate between approximately one trillion different odors. Another notable characteristic of olfaction is the strong association with the limbic system. The limbic system is involved in the processing of our emotions, survival instincts, memory formation, and connects our senses, such as odors, to our memories and emotions. That's why a smell of your favorite childhood dish evokes a strong sense of nostalgia that may not be felt when only viewing a photograph or hearing the name of that same dish. Not only is olfaction a sense in its own right associated with emotions and memories, it is also a major contributor to our perception of taste. Our sensation of taste, aka gustation, is actually 80% reliant on our sense of smell. As you chomp down that sandwich, the air odorants get inhaled into the nasal cavity as it passes under your nose and into your mouth. That's why your smell and taste get impaired when allergies or common colds occur, as seen in this diagram here. Another chemoreceptor is our gustatory receptor cells, which detect tastins. 
Similar to smell, it is chemicals that are detected by the receptors. So for olfaction, it's the olfactant that gets detected. For tastants, it's the tastant. Notice the gustatory hairs serve a similar purpose as the olfactory cilia and that the same basal cell and supporting cell friends surround that gustatory receptor cell just like they did with the olfactory receptor cell. Also similar, the odorant and tastant must diffuse in a solution before reaching the receptor. So for olfaction, that would be the mucus in your nose, and for gustation, that would be your saliva. That's why it's difficult to taste and sometimes smell with a dry mouth. Some big differences in taste are each olfactory receptor can detect several different odorants. Gustatory receptors can only detect one type of tastant, one of the five tastes, which is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. There are only five different receptors for these tastants, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, and each have their own corresponding receptor. Receptors are housed in alcoves of the taste bud. Olfactory receptors are simply embedded in a thin epithelial membrane. Sweetness is one of the favorite flavors for children and adults alike because sweet tastes are often associated with high energy foods. Sourness, which is associated with an acidic pH, is detected when an influx of hydrogen ions occurs into sour receptors, which can be described as a tart or acidic burn. Another thing is oral infections and poor dental hygiene can elicit this sour taste. Saltiness is initiated by certain ionic compounds. In general, saltiness is detected when positive ions like calcium or potassium rush into the salty receptors. Bitterness is different from sourness in that it's often described as a sharp, pungent, or disagreeable flavor. Importantly, bitterness is often associated with the potential toxins and things that we as humans should not digest huge quantities of. The less famous but equally important taste is umami. Umami is a savory, robust, beefy broth taste that is produced by amino acids, specifically glutamate. Each taste bud across your tongue can have a few different kinds of gustatory receptors, but most have only one or two, sweet and sour for example. Keep in mind, however, that certain regions of the tongue have greater density of certain buds, say buds with only sweet and sour, versus buds with all five senses, or maybe just one. Let's zoom in on the cell physiology of salty receptors. This cascade pathway is perhaps the simpler of the two you must learn. When ingesting salt, NaCl dissolves into our saliva where it dissociates into sodium and chloride ions. When the concentration of sodium outside the cell increases and reaches threshold, sodium ion channels open, allowing a rapid influx of sodium into the cell, thus leading to depolarization of the receptor. Remember, positively charged ions such as sodium move down their concentration gradient flowing from an area of high concentration to low concentration, so to the more negative environment, which in this case is a cell. This cell depolarization is amplified by the activation of calcium channels. When activated, an influx of calcium ions occurs. This two-factor depolarization is almost identical to the depolarization of neurons that you learned about in the process of neurotransmitter release. Since serotonin is the designated neurotransmitter for salty tastants and is calcium dependent, a buildup of calcium must occur before the serotonin encased vesicles can fuse with the plasma membrane and release its contents into the synapse. This concludes saltiness receptor cellular mechanism. Now, the same process will occur when detecting sourness, the only difference being the initial channel that opens and the fact that there are separate receptors for salty and sour. For sour tastants, the initial channel is hydrogen ions. You can remember that the two tastants are similar with similar mechanisms of detection by thinking of a sour Krabby Patty. It's a sour gummy and the hamburger reminds you of salty. It's a simple candy for some simple detecting mechanisms. Now, sweet, bitter, and umami tastes involve a G-protein coupled receptor. Let's see that in action. Firstly, we have to identify tastants for sweetness, bitterness, and umami. In this example, we will use glucose as a tastant for sweetness. Note that there are other tastants that can trigger these receptors, but memorizing such is beyond the scope of this class. Right off the bat, a difference between our sour Krabby Patty sour and salty receptors and these three receptors is the type of initial receptor that begins the cascade of detection. With salty and sour tastants, ion channels utilize facilitated diffusion to directly depolarize the cell via an influx of sodium and hydrogen ions. 
With sweet, bitter, and umami tastings, a G protein is used to activate phospholipase C, which you may recall from any cell physiology class, goes on to convert PIP2 into IP3 and DAC. It's IP3 that promotes the depolarization of receptors by inducing calcium receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum to open and release calcium into the cell. The rough ER here acts as your calcium reservoir. Upon the buildup of calcium inside the cell, the vesicles will release the neurotransmitters into the synapse. Taste buds, which contain gustatory receptors, are monitored primarily by cranial nerves 7 and 9, the facial and glossopharyngeal nerves, which you can remember by saying 7, 8, 9, but you have an 8 since you're still tasting it. Cranial nerves 7 and 9 contain first-order sensory neurons that synapse with nucleus solitarius of the medulla oblongata. Then the second-order neurons, sometimes referred to as the medial lemniscus, transmit the message to the thalamus. Hence, the third-order neurons carry the message to the gustatory and orbital frontal cortices where the taste can be interpreted. All in all, receptors function to transmit external stimuli into appropriate electrical signals for the brain to interpret. This certainly applies to receptors of smell and taste, two of perhaps the most exciting senses we as humans have.